I want to give a big shout out to my patrons, especially my King's Guard, which include Brendan, Nick, Oscar, Stuart, Josephine, Kaika, Amanda, RJ, Shaw, Nicoletta, Tanner, Jennifer, Frank, Sarah, Pat, Kevin, Ryan, Michael, Terrence, Wade, Darren, FM, Derry, Boss, Mitch, Sebastian, and Benjamin. Thank you all so much. You're the best. Welcome back to the Fancy Network, everyone. My name is, of course, Jimmy Nuts, and today we're going to be talking about The Winter King by Bernard Cornwell. This is book one in the Warlord Chronicles. This is an Arthurian tale, has been told time and time again, but I don't think ever quite like this. Uh, it is told from a first-person perspective. It's kind of a retelling of someone looking back on their time near Arthur and all these cir circumstances. And his name is Durful. He's f <laughs> He definitely has his faults. He makes mistakes, and he's very, very human. Sometimes whenever you take a perspective of someone who was just there and you see Arthur, this big, amazing character, uh, sometimes that can be a miss. Actually, in Brothers, um, I think it was Brothers of the Wind, I might be getting it wrong, but Tad Williams' novella that he just released in Ostinar, I kind of felt suffered from not being as interesting as I thought it would be because of the side character perspective in the first person. This does not fall to that at all. This stands up because Durful is such an amazing uh, narrator per se, but also just a great character that I think is very sympathetic, uh, that sometimes feels like our eyes into this situation that we think we know in and out because of how many times it's been retold. But Durful adds a fresh perspective to the Arthurian tale. Now, a lot of people will talk about Arthurian tales and some people are tired of them. I am a fan, but not in, as in like, I've read everything and I seek it out. But I like the idea, right, of, of the sword and the stone, all these things. They, they intrigue me as a kid. I was drawn to them, but I'm not an expert by any means. But I can say that without a doubt, even with Winter King only read, this is going to be my favorite telling of this story. And partially because Bernard Cornwell is just a fantastic writer. I know a lot of people that watch my channel are big fans of John Gwen. I think John Gwen has definitely been inspired a lot <laughs> by even this book here, but I imagine Bernard Cornwell as an author as a whole. So if you're into John Gwen, you're going to like this. Uh, they're not one for one by any means, but Bernard Cornwell's action is just amazing. It's so good. It's so vivid. Uh, there's like a levity to some of the situations that he puts his characters in on the battlefield that you can really feel in your chest. I talk about combat and battle a lot here on the channel, but I have to make a confession. Over the last, I don't know how long I've been doing this, two and a half, two years, two years I've been doing this. Um, I am not the biggest fan of combat as a whole. I see a combat a lot of times as a thing I need to get through to find out what the consequences are to get to the next piece of dialogue. I'm a big fan of consequences and dialogue in my books. So combat sometimes can just feel like part of the process. But then there are a few writers who will write an action scene that pull me in and make me forget about what comes next and really live in the moment. And I think even just by reading Winter King, I don't know if there's ever been an author, maybe except for John Gwen that I'm thinking of, that has put me into the trenches like this. Uh, Steven Erickson also does a wonderful job of this. Uh, but man, Bernard Cornwell's combat, everyone talks about it, and I can really say it lives up to the hype. But in addition to that, it's not just the combat and the moves and all these things. It's more so the atmosphere and the way that he tells his story. Because it's historical fiction, because a lot of stuff does happen in the context of the story, uh, it, it takes some getting used to. And what I mean by that is you will pass large amounts of periods of time, maybe between battles, but not always battles, just between scenes. And I'm kind of getting out of the combat talk and really talking about what made this book special for me. And it's the fact that when time passes and we get the descriptions of events that have ha taken place over maybe even a few months, and then we get to zoom in on the next moment and the next scene. Now that might sound like it could be lofty or airy, but it's not. The way that Bernard Cornwell levies this and uses this mechanic in his story, it adds so much tension and so much atmosphere for everything that's built around a scene. And in this case, I'm kind of talking about combat specifically, but you could apply this to everything in this book. You get plopped down on a battlefield, you know the circumstances, you know the stakes, you know the odds that these people may not come out of this alive. And then the way that he describes the land and the feeling of that battle, uh, really takes precedence even over the details, in my opinion. And it did take me about a third of this book to get used to time passing in such big chunks and then zooming in on our next scene or, or where the progress would be coming from. That took me a little bit to get used to. 
And for those who are reading this and saying, eh, Arthurian tale, it's more like a historical tale. Maybe it's not fantasy. I don't really care um, about, there's a big argument, is this historical fiction or is it historical fantasy? I don't really care uh, about that. It doesn't, whatever you want to call it is fine with me. But what I am going to say is that I think if you're a fan of fantasy, wanting to dip your toes maybe in a little bit of historical fiction at all, uh, Bernard Cornwell is obviously a very prolific historical fiction writer, this feels like fantasy in a lot of ways. We hear Rome mentioned, right? Uh, Jesus, uh, a bunch of things that were in our world existing in this world, right? Or memories of that. However, the scale, the characters, uh, everything about this feels like epic fantasy. And that is a awesome thing for me. And I clicked with this so much because of that. And I'll actually read you a little excerpt of Bernard Cornwell's writing that I love so much. His clean-shaven black face was smeared with blood and sweat, but there was joy in his eyes, for this was proving to be a fight that would make the poet struggle for new words to describe a battle, a fight that men would remember in smoky halls for winters to come, a fight that, even lost, would send a man in honor to the warrior halls of the other world. I don't know. It's not, it's not like the most fancy writing of all time, but does it get the point across? Is it a very, very long sentence that he lets keep going and keep going to build this image and this epicness? Yes, and I like that a lot. There are times in these battle scenes where it will go forever long without a punctuation and you're holding your breath as you're reading. Uh, th these are the things, like people reward a lot of prose with it being purpley or being flowery, but it's also little things like this in the craft of writing that can make a simple battle scene or a simple conversation means so much more. Bernard Cornwell is like sneakily very, very skilled. And you can see it with things like that, but even more so whenever you get into the book and you see these, you know, run on sentences, I guess we'll call them. Uh, but they just capture the stress and, the ten and just the tension of a situation. And every character, even if they're briefly on screen, feels so distinct. And a lot of this comes from you know, the archetypes of these characters in this tale that we've seen retold time and time again. But I love Durfal, and I've kind of already ranted about Durfal a little bit about how much I enjoyed him. Uh, but to give you a really cool perspective of, of change that we know has happened, this is being retold by Durfal. He's writing it down. So this is like his account of our Thorian tale, right? And he is now underneath a bishop that we see earlier in the story, and he's a Christian. But whenever he's in the retelling, he's actually kind of like an apprentice or a junior to a druid in following those gods that are blinking in my head right now, and I can't remember what they're called. But, you know, I know this change is going to come, and this happens in Chronicling Tales, where we know somewhat of the ending, right? Or at least where our narrator ends up, because they're telling the story. But that is some of the growth that I'm expecting to see. And you can see Durful, I mean, he starts out pretty young, but growing before your very eyes with these large leaps of time passing and the way the narration goes. Uh, but it feels it feels natural, it really does. And Durful is just so endearing that I had to mention him again. And Durful will make mistakes, don't get you wrong. He frustrates me, reminds me a little bit of Fitz, not nearly you know, to that level. Uh, but man, when Durful, even when he messes up, I'm still cheering for him because sometimes he makes mistakes that I would make as well. And I think a lot of people watching this could relate to that uh, whenever you read it. And being set in the Dark Ages is, I mean, it's probably my favorite time period in history. I've always really just been fascinated with it and seeing this set in the Dark Ages makes me realize I need to read more works that are set in the Dark Ages. In fact, if you know any other books, historical fiction or fantasy or whatever, that are set in the Dark Ages, please leave them below in a comment. I would love that. Part of the really awesome stuff here is the restriction of knowledge in the Dark Ages and not having all the accounts of like, let's say Rome. Like they obviously see like paved roads and things that came from the Roman Empire, but they don't know everything. For instance, they are trying, and this isn't a, this is no spoiler, but this is just a little tidbit, and it's a, it won't ruin anything. But the whole story, people are trying to figure out what camels are. Some people say, "Well, of course, it's like coal. It's it's like a fire start, a mineral." Some people say, "Oh, a camel? That's a fish, duh!" Because they see that the Romans have accounts for it, but they've never themselves seen camels and don't know what it is because they don't have the full account. I love stuff like this, like the restriction of information, adding a mystique and a magical sense to the world is where the fantasy elements come in, in this story. So what they believe to be mystical, like the druids and things like this, they remain canon as magic in this world because they believe it. And that's all you need, right? Uh, we know that it's not now, but I didn't, I didn't think like that when I read this book. I felt entrenched in the Dark Ages. And that's kind of what I was talking about at the beginning of this review, is just the atmosphere and the settling in, in this scene feels so easy 
and so immersive. And if there was anything about this book that surprised me, I always like to ask myself, like, did this book do something that I didn't expect it to do? And to be quite honest, it did. Uh, Bernard Cornwell, one, uh, I, I, I don't know why, but I thought it would be a little bit more of like a family-friendly affair, and it is. Like, I, there's not a bunch of drastic curse words, but you know, it's not the most explicit book ever. I just read The Grey Bastards, that's an explicit book. This is not an explicit book, but Bernard Cornwell does not shy away from the devastation and the sadness that comes along with war and the epic heroic tale. There is the other side of that, and that is what plays out in a human's mind after they take someone's life. I like that he explores this, but on top of this and on a different note, the thing that surprised me the most about this was actually how shocking some of the things that happen are in this book. And not all of them are a big like reveal or a big death or something like that. I mean just genuinely being in the scene with Durful, seeing things unfold, and then out of nowhere something changes or something happens. There were plenty of times in this book where I like, you know, literally went, what? <laughs> Did this just happen? Like you get comfortable in the conversation and then something bah, jumps out. And it kind of scared me at some points. And the Isle of the Dead, which you'll see in this book, is one of my now favorite scenes in all of reading. I, 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 I could feel just how spooky it was. There's a hair there, sorry. <laughs> I could feel how spooky it was. And some of the things that happen on this are just so erratic and just so random. I was shocked with how many times Bernard Cornwell surprised me with the actions of characters, with the way things played out. Uh, you may think, ah, this tale's been told a hundred times, I've heard it a thousand times, but there's still surprises to be had here. And that is the biggest takeaway from The Winter King. And as I go into Enemy of God and Excalibur, which I'll be reading over April, uh, well, March and April, this month and next month, I'll get it finished because I'm definitely gonna do this trilogy, is that there's still some surprise to be had and he has my full attention. I am itching to get to Enemy of God, which is book two. I don't know if I'll review each book individually because I feel like a lot of what I just said is kind of a blanket statement for what Cornwell's giving you as an experience to the reader. However, maybe I will do something to kind of conclude all of my thoughts for the three because from what I understand from all my friends who have read this, there's still a lot more to go, but also a lot more characters that are gonna be featured. Everyone talks about how big of a douchebag Lancelot is. I met Lancelot in this book. He was a douchebag, but I need to see him come more center stage to become this viscerally hated character that everyone talks about. So that's what I'm really looking forward to in book two and book three, actually, is just to hate Lancelot. <laughs> but also to see the amazing battles, see Durful grow as a character, and also see what makes Arthur such an epic legend that has been retold hundreds and thousands of times. I, I feel like this does that tale justice whenever it almost seems like it's been redundant and done before. So that's what's special about The Winter King is that it still tends to surprise you and bring you into the situation that you already know uh, kind of what happens. There's a lot of twists and turns here. And I really loved this book. I did. Uh, it did take me a little bit uh, to get used to it. Once I was in it, I could not put this down. And I have to tell you that uh, Jonathan Keeble, I believe is his name, the audiobook for this is among the best I've ever heard. I, I, I think the performance is flawless. I really do. I absolutely love it. I've heard some people say it sounds like Monty Python. I thought that was really funny. Um, I don't have a problem with that, but if you do, you maybe, maybe you won't like the audio narration as much as me, but I happen to just absolutely adore it. And really, I would recommend you checking this out. If you've wanted to check out Bernard Cornwell, because a lot of people know him for his Last Kingdom series or a Sharp series, this is a great entry point. Some people say this is his best work, and a lot of people say this is the best Arthurian retelling ever. So uh, take that for what you will. I loved it. I hope you check it out. If you have, let me do it out in the comments, or if you plan to, also let me do it out in the comments. If you liked the video, hit like and subscribe. There's a Patreon in the description. It's optional, but always appreciated. Until I see you next time, whether it's for Enemy of God or another book, I hope you're good, and I hope you're safe. Remember to always... Keep turning the page.